Welcome to this week's virtual worship service here at College Hill Presbyterian Church in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I'm Bill Nolan, the moderator of the worship and music ministry team and a member of session here at College Hill. On this Independence Day weekend, we will have a special guest preacher with us, the Reverend Olivia Lane, who has preached from our pulpit once before. Today, she will share her message from her home as we continue to worship together virtually during these times of COVID-19. We want to thank her for being with us today. And we also have the first in a series of soloists from our choir who will be performing our anthem today. Lori Dector Wright is our soloist today and we'll have a different soloist from the choir each Sunday for the next several weeks. Let's prepare our hearts and minds now to worship as we listen to our prelude. Good morning, I'm Reverend Olivia Lane, and it is a joy to be able to be with you this morning in worship. Technology is an incredible tool, and as we have continued to navigate this season of what it means to be a church who worships in different places and at different times, I am grateful to be able to share this exploration with you and to be able to share a word from scripture. So thank you for having me this morning at College Hill Presbyterian Church. Most of my work hours now are taken with spiritual direction and with praying for and with pastors in our presbytery. And I still feel I have so much to learn about prayer. And I still feel this need to be reminded that when I pray, it's about being open to the possibility of me changing my stance not necessarily God changing the world around me. And as I've been sitting with that, I am reminded that in prayer, we learn how to hold difficult truths. We learn how to hold the difficult truth that so many of our black sisters and brothers have experienced violence because of the system in which we live. And that when we don't use our voices and our actions in solidarity and allyship, we promote and continue these systems. And difficult truths like crime still happens in our world. And this week in our city of Tulsa, we lost a member of the police force to violent crime to senseless and tragic and violent crime. And that we as Christians are called to mourn with those who mourn. Whether we are in the same place or in different places. And so as we prepare for prayer together, I invite you to turn your hearts toward the reality that in prayer we hold difficult truths. And we have a loving and gracious God who hears us as we name those truths. Let us pray. Gracious God, you who live and love through each one of us, 
We thank you for your presence that meets us wherever we are this morning. Whether we are sitting on our porch or on the comfort of our own couches, maybe out taking a walk, we acknowledge that your spirit is at work and your presence is with us. We come to you this morning in gratitude, thankful and hopeful that you are a God who extends relationship to us. That we have this ministry and this invitation from the person of Jesus. That we are able to experience when we turn and say yes. And also we come to you hopeful and grateful Recognizing that we've just celebrated a major holiday for our country. We have had a day of remembrance. A day to recognize the freedom that many have experienced as a result of being in this land. And we also acknowledge that there are many who have not experienced these freedoms. And we remember that in Jesus of Nazareth, You have called us to be a people of peace, saying, Blessed are the peacemakers. And you remind us that we are to love our neighbor and our enemy as we love ourselves, and we give thanks for the courage of all those who seek to enact justice and peace in our country. We give thanks for community and country and humanity and all who tirelessly bring peace to our world. As we journey into the heat of sticky summer days and balmy lightning bug filled nights, we ask that you would weave us into a community showing forth your light, your hope, your power, and your tenderness. Where our imagination fails, give us courage. Give us courage to continue to seek what it means to be a people not just bound by buildings, by visible ways of being, but a people who know you in our interiors and in that knowing have courage to do your work in the world. Bless us in our differences and embolden us in courage to stand together to serve our community and one another. We call on you today to gather us in your love. May we accept the invitation to return to you. Lead us to better know you and glorify you on each step, no matter where we are in this journey. May the work to which you have called each one of us lay the foundation for healing and wholeness, compassion and encouragement, strength and comfort, and may all that we do bring glory to you, O God. We ask this. In the name of the lover and the beloved and the love that binds us together. Amen.
Our gospel reading this morning is found in the book of Matthew, chapter 11, verses 16 through 19 and 25 through 30. I invite you now to follow along as we listen for a word from the Lord. But to what will I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to one another, we played the flute for you and you did not dance, and we wailed and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, he has a demon. The son of man came eating and drinking, and they say, look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners, yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. At that time, Jesus said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. All things have been handed over to me by the Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you that are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Here ends the reading. Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, you who continually offer your presence to us, help us to be awake to your living word among us always, and where we experience exhaustion, give us rest. Where we experience fear, renew our faith in you. Help us to heed your calling to serve and love all people and to see you for who you are. In the name of Christ, our living Lord. Amen. We've been spending a lot of time in the state parks over the past several months. My children got state park passports and they received stickers and medals for visiting various parks and appreciating various parts of them like skipping rocks on the lake or hiking trails or observing different creatures in their natural habitats. It's one of the things that we can do during this time with some physical distance, especially as it seems there aren't a lot of people who enjoy hiking in 86% humidity on a 98 degree morning. The beauty of an Oklahoma summer. But all this time, walking silent paths through forests and staring at hills that are the result of fault lines that shifted just a couple thousand years ago, or, or maybe at the mountains, in the case of the Ar Arbuckle Mountains, that are 1.4 billion years old. Being in our world in this way has turned my mind to questions about time, how we occupy it, what our purpose is during this brief moment when we breathe together. In our gospel passage this morning, Jesus describes children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to each other with songs that no one really seems to hear or appreciate. There's this striking image of children trying to elicit some kind of emotional response, either joy at their lighthearted tunes or grief as they literally wail. But they get no response. The gospel goes on in verse 18, saying that when John the Baptist comes along and preaches sober repentance, he's accused of being possessed by a demon. And alternately, when Jesus arrives and breaks bread and shares a common cup, he's a glutton and a drunkard. And worst of all, a friend to the wrong type of people.
The opening line, but to what will I compare this generation? That was hard for me to hear this week. This is a generation of people who continually and reliably miss the point. That's what the gospel writer is conveying here. That even when people have evidence right in front of them, they miss what really matters. And that truth feels so hard right now in an experience of the world where it is really unclear what we should actually do. Debbie Thomas in her lectionary commentary on Journey with Jesus puts it this way, we don't know when to dance, when to mourn, when to repent, when to celebrate. We claim to be wise and discerning, but we don't recognize the divine when we encounter it. God is always too much or too little for us, too severe or too generous, too demanding or too provocative. On our own, we have little capacity to discern what is good and right and holy and true. When I want to do good, Paul writes, evil lies close at hand. That's the first five verses of our text this morning, but then the gospel passage takes a turn. And if you look at the beginning of this chapter at verse three, there's this question. The disciples are asking of Jesus, are you the one who is to come or are we to wait for another? And our five remaining verses seem to be the response to that original question. We just heard about people who are likened to children who miss the point. They miss the thing that is obvious and directly in front of them, yet Jesus proceeds to teach them. And he begins this teaching by thanking God that the truth has been hidden from those who are wise and instead revealed to infants, those least likely to be able to grasp the magnitude of this revelation. Or in my personal vernacular translation, thank you God for the short-sighted, who believe they are brilliant and yet believe the lies of the culture, and for the most vulnerable of all, who are indeed the ones who see you. See, the truth of Jesus' revelation, the teaching of Jesus here in this gospel passage is for the short-sighted and the vulnerable for those who believe themselves to have all the answers and those who would have none. I need this reminder. Because it's with this reminder that Jesus makes his famous invitation in verses 28 through 30 where he says, Come to me, all you who are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke on you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. If I'm being completely honest this morning, this is an invitation that is harder for me to believe on some days than others. Because there are those days when life isn't so burdensome. Days when I, I race through the tall grass chasing giggling children who are delighted by their first view of a bison, or as my three-year-old daughter put it, I love when words become real, when I can see a thing I had only heard. There are days when I can appreciate the beauty and the wonder and the majesty of our world and our life. And then there are other days. Days when we lose people that we love, when death and destruction are the order of the empire and pain and suffering are all that I taste. And even though I know that our God has a heart for the vulnerable and hurting, and even though, as the Psalm this morning said, the Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up those who are bowed down, there are those days 
But even though I know this invitation is especially for those days, I find it hard to turn to Jesus. Yet, the gospel says that Jesus offers respite for the weary and not just respite, but instruction. I don't want us to miss this piece about learning from Jesus. Because if you're familiar with the concept of a yoke, then likely you know that as a piece of equipment for an animal. But this term of yoke was also one that was used in rabbinic literature to refer to the task of obedience to the Torah, obedience to the law. And in order to obey the law, you have to know the law. And Jesus, when he's speaking here, he knows that attempting to follow the law in the way that the people had been attempting to follow it was burdensome. And Jesus says, I came not to abolish the law, but to fulfill it, to show you the point of it. And Jesus also said that the law was summed up in this, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus knew that the way the law was practiced was cumbersome and hard and a burden and Jesus offers the short-sighted and the vulnerable a way to the heart of the law. Instruction that would enable them and all of us to find rest for our souls, to know and to be known. From the start of the church, there has been a commitment to engage in the work of contemplation. And when I say contemplation here, what I mean is that throughout time, the church has used practices which aim to look at or gaze upon or be aware of God and the divine. And these are practices that draw our awareness intentionally away from the noise of the world and toward the rest and the teaching of Jesus. This looks different over centuries, right? You can think of some of the earliest practices that we know of coming from the ascetics and monastics, those known as the desert mothers and fathers. You can bear to mind the ecstatic revelation of the Middle Ages, or maybe more recently, the many communities built around prayer and radical love of self and others. The language has moved, but the posture has stayed. And the posture, the contemplation, invites people into a space of dwelling with God, a space of rest. And we need rest. We need to be reminded on our best days and our worst and all of our days between that the invitation is there. We just have to say yes. Adam Kleinfelter, who writes about spiritual practices, in his book, A Year of Meditations, puts it this way. We need to carve out space in our busy, hectic lives because our identity is not bound to our ability to make, acquire, produce, consume, or develop. Sometimes we think that making or consuming, whether that means products, connections, or experiences, will fill the gap in our souls. But when we let those gaps become places where we meet God, amazing things happen. We enter into this in-between space and time, holding one set of assumptions and ideals, and we exit it in a different way. To truly enter the cauldron of transformation, metanoia, repentance, and rebirth, is to enter the space where we meet God and are changed. I think that we are a truly exhausted people. The National Sleep Foundation reports that in America, 70% of adults obtain insufficient sleep on a regular basis. And about 70 million Americans operate on inadequate sleep at any given time. Now we know that fatigue 
affects us in tremendous ways. It slows our reflex response, it clouds our decision making, it harms our immune systems, and coupled with the general stress of a global pandemic, national strife, economic insecurity, and interpersonal frustration, I wonder that any of us have any capacity to accept this invitation from Jesus to learn and rest. Yet here is the invitation offered to everyone, both the short-sighted and the vulnerable. Jesus says, if you turn to me, if you come to me and dwell with me, I will teach you how to be in a world that misses the point. In a world where news is fake and you don't know how to be joyful or mourn, in a world where lives are expendable and power is everything, Jesus says, I have another way. I can offer respite that the world cannot. I can teach you to live peaceably and to cease from toil. Will you come to me? Will you learn from me? Perhaps this morning the question remains for you, how does one come to Jesus? We spend a lot of time as Christians trying to do the right thing, but how do we know what is real? How are we to be in the space of our breaths? My mention of contemplation earlier wasn't a non sequitur. Jesus' invitation to the knowledge of the heart of the law needs to be accepted, and we accept it through the work of contemplation and prayer and a willingness to return to seek and know and to be known by God. Building that knowing takes time and it takes stillness and uncertainty and vulnerability. It takes worshiping and communities of faith and accountability and trust in who we are and whose we are. This is the internal work the church has been about since the beginning. This is the work that fortifies individuals and communities to then reach outside of themselves and spread the knowing of God and God's love in a broken and hurting and exhausted world. Will you say yes? The months ahead of us are entirely uncertain. Truthfully, all our moments are. But what will be said of our generations? Will we be a people who forget how to celebrate and grieve, who hail prophets as mentally ill and salvation as drunkenness and gluttony? Or will we accept the invitation, break the bread and drink the cup, remember our salvation, and learn and rest? Will we find that radiant sanctuary as St. Teresa of Avila names it in her Invitation to Contemplation, where she says, There is a secret place, a radiant sanctuary, as real as your own kitchen, more real than that, constructed of the purest elements, overflowing with the 10,000 beautiful things, worlds within worlds, forests, rivers, velvet coverlets thrown over feather beds, fountains bubbling beneath a canopy of stars, bountiful forests, universal libraries. A wine cellar offering an intoxication so sweet you will never be sober again, a clarity so complete you will never again forget. This is the magnificent refuge inside you. Enter. Shatter the darkness that shrouds the doorway. Believe the incredible truth that the beloved has chosen for his dwelling place the core of your own being because that is the single most beautiful place in all of creation. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Friends, what will be said of our generations? Will we be a people who remember how to celebrate and how to mourn? Will we be a people who can hold complex truths, but not so tightly that we are unable to see God at work transforming us and our world? Our God is a God of freedom and fireworks and of justice and peacemaking. And so may the one who knows you and loves you, bless you, and may you be a person who knows how to celebrate and how to wail, who experiences the rich possibility of our breath during this time and space. And may the one who keeps all of our days and deeds keep them in peace. Amen. <laughs>